Here you go. We're good. All right. Having been given the thumbs up from the technology department, we will begin uh, this 2021 budget hearing agenda for the Finance and Ways and Means Committee of Bowling Green City Council. Um, I did have to create a brief agenda for my colleagues here. And um, first, I'd just like to um, express uh, many thanks to the mayor and Lori and Joe and, and Brian and, and all the department heads who worked to build this budget in, in very unusual times. Um, this budget appears to be a reasonable response to the economic challenges that have been presented to us and appears to maintain the level of services the citizens enjoy and expect, particularly police, fire, utilities, and infrastructure. The executive summary of this document is very clear and well-written in the, in the project and projects a tempered optimism for improving economic circumstances in 2021 while recognizing income tax revenue will be down in 2020. And in response, the executive summary also highlights the administration's response of implementing cost savings measures in all departments, and I appreciate that. I'm pleased to see a number of important items addressed in this document. Um, payroll stabilization fund is restarted for the next 11 year cycle. And this, to me, is a gift to our successors if, if we can maintain the annual contributions of this fund. Um, additionally, um, the priorities established by council in February are addressed. Uh, the city will be taking an important step to fund and purchase the implementation of police body worn cameras. Road and sidewalk repairs are addressed. And the need to, for improved radio communication via March radios for the fire division is addressed. So I very much look forward to this presentation and I'll offer my colleagues a moment to uh, make any opening remarks. I have no remarks. I just wanted to, and I guess I can say it now and perhaps later, uh, I've been involved in city budgeting in a number of capacities, ranging from being on the finance committee to uh, observing and being sometimes at the budget hearings, the, the only non-council member in a non-city administration person present when there used to be multiple meetings every year. And I can safely say, and um, confidently say that this uh, executive summary is a work of art. It's uh, obvious that it's a result of many people's input in, in putting the summary together. And then you've got the background, which is many hours of work. And uh, I think that being someone who is sometimes brevity challenged, the, the exact uh, right amount of uh, detail has been put forth and not only in, in summarizing what the money, where the money's coming from or where it's going, but also the priorities. I, I thought that was an exemplary job that was done in saying, these are the things we're concentrating on and this is why, and this is how we're doing it. And as far as working with uh, the entire city, the, this document, if anyone needs evidence of how well this city functions. And by that, I mean the administration and everybody that department heads, it's this, the directive was given to cut uh, in an intelligent way. It's shown that that was done. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the, the work that Lori and Brian Bushong have put in to put this together. It's a well-oiled team. So I wanna make sure that, the, that you all get the credit you deserve for the type of work that went into putting this together. And uh, it's not only a balancing act in terms of how it's communicated and how it's put together, but uh, also in terms of the very challenging times that we are in. Uh, I'm, I'm just very, very impressed with the work and I wanna thank you all for it. Yeah. All right, thanks, Bill. I think now uh, we'll hear from our mayor. 
Good, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm very pleased and excited to present my first official budget to you as the mayor. This is an important responsibility and one that I don't take lightly. Our charter spells out that the mayor, quote, shall be responsible for the preparation and submission of the annual estimate of receipts and expenditures and of, and of appropriation measures, end quote. Presenting this budget is important to me because it provides an opportunity to communicate priorities. It also provides a sense of balance as we continue to fund the important services we all come to expect and rely on. Something that I knew during my years on council that has become even more apparent during my first year as mayor is the dedication and hard work exhibited by the employees of the city as they provide the many day-to-day -day services that we enjoy and frankly, we sometimes take for granted. These day-to-day -day services of our police, fire and ambulance, public works, utilities, parks and recreation, and all of the other departments keep our citizens safe, keep traffic moving, provide clean streets, deliver dependable electric service and safe drinking water, and provide us with a safe and enjoyable place to raise our families and call home. As you would expect, funding these essential services is a major part of this budget. It became clear early in 2020 that the COVID-19 pandemic was going to have a substantial impact on the city's finances and would also impact citizens and businesses here in Bowling Green, across the state and the entire country. I began speaking with staff and with council about my belief that we needed to address our short-term financial issues, but not at the expense of our future. Our priorities had to include addressing the effects of the pandemic on our budget and our operations, and our priorities must include a futuristic view. We must lay the groundwork for our future vision. This budget provides both balance and a path towards addressing these priorities. As you will hear this evening and as you read the budget summary included with your books, despite the pandemic and the short-term economic toll, we are prioritizing efforts to keep the city moving forward. We are funding body-worn cameras for our police. <clears throat> we are including street paving projects, various capital investments in our equipment and facilities, a new city building project, and various council goals, such as launching a pilot program for food waste composting, continuing our implementation of complete street design concepts and roadway improvements, and a continued focus on energy efficiency and sustainability efforts. The periodic financial updates uh, to the finance committee that were instituted by Councilman Robinette helped us keep our finger on the pulse of the financial impacts from the COVID pandemic. These updates help us understand the scope of the problem as well as help us monitor efforts to utilize funds received from both the state and the federal government without the relief provided through the CARES Act funds for direct COVID related expenses <clears throat> and for safety forces salaries as well as dollars received through the Bureau of Workmen's Compensation, the budget for 2021 would look much different than it does now. Finally, I'd like to thank all the staff that has been involved in the development of this budget, beginning with Lori Treader, Joe Fawcett, Brian Bashong, and Brian O'Connell, and also our department heads and their staff who helped make the priorities fit, and the administrative staff to help develop and organize the budget that you have before you this evening. It truly is a group effort, and I could not possibly be more proud of this team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori for review of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> All right. Uh, somebody give me a signal if anybody at home is having trouble. Text Joe or something. If you're having trouble hearing me, I'm going to try to speak as clearly as I can this evening. All right. So here we are at our agenda for tonight. This is our agenda for the evening. We've already heard from the mayor, and I will give you a brief summary of 2020, discuss the highlights of the 2021 budget proposal, take a strategic look at some of our funds, and then conclude with questions that you may have. As Mayor Osbacher mentioned, and as everyone knows, the challenges of 2020 have been unprecedented in many ways. In putting together an annual budget, one is always mindful of the year concluding, but the impact of 2020 was a significant factor in the development of the 2021 budget. As our slide here shows, 
I think that we are all thankful to be at the review part of 2020, meaning that this calendar year is getting close to being behind us. I agree with Mayor Osbacher that the regular meetings of this committee have been a really good idea to foster commu continuing communication and status reports on the financial impacts throughout the year. As council is aware, there were numerous impacts on the forecasted, but the budget that was forecasted at the start of 2020. Several revenue areas fell short of projections, while unanticipated revenues provided balance to these shortfalls. It is anticipated that income tax revenue will be down 7.4% in 2020 from the original 2020 budget estimate. Thanks to Finance Director Bouchong's regular financial updates and careful monitoring of the city's financial status, the decreases in revenue were identified early and action was taken. Among the reductions were cost-saving measure, measures such as a hiring freeze, elimination of annual salary increases, and other expenditure reductions. We immediately prioritized the safety of our staff and citizens, recognizing that most of our services were required to continue, but in most cases would have to be delivered in a modified fashion. As hard as this year has been, there are so many things that I look back upon with pride at the ability of the staff to keep emerging and critical community priorities at the forefront and adapt as required for continuing city operations. Another bright spot in a year that had a lot of darkness was in the form of unanticipated revenues. Refunds from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, the CARES Act funding, and additional funding from existing grant programs provided a balance to the revenue losses. This resulted in a year-end cash balance that is the basis for our 2021 budget. The 2021 budget proved to be quite a balancing act. With the previously described financial circumstances as a backdrop, the uncertainty of economic recovery, and the encouragement of the mayor to monitor and be responsive to both present and future needs, getting it right for this budget was a challenge. Overreact and assume the worst, and we make significant cuts that impact people and services. If that doesn't come true, we've made unnecessary adjustments that impacted the community negatively. Underreact, and we risk placing the city in a concerning financial situation that puts us behind if we can't fulfill our obligations. We feel that the 2021 budget <clears throat> is a measured approach. It acknowledges where 2020 leaves off, continues services, addresses goals, and includes programmed future projects with designated funding pathways. Walking a tightrope is just that. We know that we may wobble a bit on our journey, but if 2020 taught us anything, it is that our system has built-in opportunities for resiliency. As we encounter challenges along our journey, we can reassess, find our balance, and then continue on our way. On the financial front, we anticipate a gradual economic recovery as 2021 progresses. As previously mentioned, income tax revenue will be down markedly in 2020 from the original projections. We see improvement in 2021 and have included projections of a 5% increase in receipts as compared to 2020 actual receipts. Of course, there are numerous other revenue sources in this budget. Projections for those vary on the category and were analyzed as part of the budget recommendation. Some categories, like property taxes, have not been impacted significantly, while other categories, most often those associated with activities, have declined. As one can extrapolate from living through a pandemic year, some things go on, others get modified, and some things go completely on hold. The budget was based on maintaining current service levels, meaning no expansion or contraction of staff, no long-term changes to our scope of services, and the budget was built with fees maintained at current levels. With the items on the previous slide as our base assumptions for form formulating the, the budget, 
we then looked at items to prioritize in the 2021 budget. The base priorities are listed here, and the next several slides will examine these categories in more detail. While the scope of the budget touches on many areas of operations, one of the most noticeable and important components of our work is our delivery of services. As mentioned in on a previous slide, a budget assumption is continuing our work in the community. This is on the spectrum from life-saving to security, to health and sanitation, to quality of life, and a lot of things in between. It includes those things that one can easily take for granted, that the street is cleaned and the roads are engineered correctly, to those things that are necessary for a cohesive community, for example, the height of your neighbor's fence, to those things that enhance your life, like walking in a park. Behind the scenes, there are numerous people providing for the fair, accessible, accountable, and steady administration and processing that accompanies the operation of any organization or business. We should also note that many of these areas aid and support our elected and appointed officials, including our many citizen volunteer boards and commissions, so that their deliberations are efficient. The non-utility expense budget is over 80 four million dollars. Now you can take off about 20 million dollars of that for internal transfers, which basically just means moving items within the budget. And this is a weighty responsibility to manage and be responsible for the many components of this budget. Add in the utility budget and the amount to be appropriated in the 2021 annual budget appropriation ordinance, which will be part of council's packet for your Monday evening meeting, will be approximately $172,494,000. Discussing the numerous details and line items that make up this budget doesn't make for an exciting presentation, but these everyday expenditures are very important as it's a very large component of our budget. Our department and division heads are careful and considerate in their budget submissions taking into account the components needed for their operations, working to be and improve efficiency and effectiveness, reflecting the city's priorities, and providing proper oversight and accountability for their designated areas. Of course, as part of this assembled budget book, budgets have been carefully reviewed and scrutinized to ensure continuing compliance with these important areas. As mentioned previously, the funding for these areas is one of our base assumptions. Once funding is allocated for these ongoing services, we begin to look at the other priorities in other areas of the budget for inclusion. And we do wanna note that, of course, our department heads are normally here and joining us in the council chamber due to COVID protocols. We ask them to remain um, in their offices or in another remote location to, to join us uh, via the computer. Discussions about policing during 2020 resulted in adaptations to reflect feedback from elected officials and citizens. Our police division, which was actively engaged in conversations about policing, shared in support for an emerging priority related to transparency, equipping officers with body-worn cameras. This is not new technology for police, and in fact, the Bowling Green Police Division has had in-car cameras for decades. However, as this slide shows, there are numerous costs associated with body-worn cameras. Although the division has previously recommended the system, funding had not been previously prioritized because of the rather large initial and ongoing costs. It has now been prioritized, and it is included in the 2021 budget. As you'll see, this is an approximately $125,000 investment, and there will be ongoing costs related to the software and other components to maintain the system. As noted in the executive summary of the budget, the police have applied for a grant for cameras. Because the status is unknown, and this is such a high priority, full funding is included, although we certainly hope to see some financial relief in the form of a grant. There is $600,000 designated for road paving in the 2021 budget. Of that amount, 
$400,000 will be for general road paving. Putting together the <clears throat> annual paving program is another example of balancing priorities. In determining the priority, priority for street paving, the Public Works Department relies on the pavement condition index that rates the quality of streets, visual inspection by department employees, traffic volumes, and other conditions <laughs> relating to and other conditions relating to the road conditions. Because the cost for roads and sometimes the extent of the repair vary so widely, it is not as simple as starting with the worst road based on the index and working down the list. Once the budget appropriation is made, Public Works will consider the factors above, including proximities, for example, roads in, adjacent to one another in a subdivision, and develop the specifics for the program. For 2021, that list is still in development, with considerations being given to South Church Street, the Quail Hollow South Subdivision, the Coventry Subdivision, Sand Ridge Road, West Gypsy Lane Road, and Thurston Avenue between Wooster Street and Court Street. The final paving list will be determined in early 2021. The other $200,000 in the budget is to begin the work on Wooster Street. This is a two-year project that is being funded in conjunction with the ODOT Urban Paving Program. As the table shows, the paving portion that will occur in 2021 is on East Wooster Street from Campbell Hill Road to the CSX railroad tracks. West Wooster Street will likely have utility related work in 2021 as well, in anticipation of the paving improvements listed on the table, which will occur in 2022. Part of our prioritization work is looking ahead to future projects and commitments to ensure that adequate financial capacity is available. We have three upcoming partner projects. As part of the ongoing safety, traffic, pedestrian and bike, and aesthetic improvements at the city's I-75 entrance, a roundabout will be added at Campbell Hill and East Wooster Street in 2023. In connection, a median will be added in the area between the interstate and Campbell Hill. This is a critical safety enha enhancement for that corridor for that corridor because it will eliminate the dangerous T-bone crashes that occur when left turns are present and that we have seen throughout the corridor. It will also be another link in completing the vision outlined in the 2015 East Wooster Street Corridor study. The vision for this area, in addition to the very important safety components, is to bring down the scale to make it a more welcoming entry to our community, in addition to reflecting the character of the town. A transformation like the one we are working on in this area will be over a decade in development as it is required to be for financial and access purposes. The partnerships leveraged as part of this process are critical. While funding is not allocated in the 2021 budget, we are mindful that there will be upcoming financial commitment and, preparation, and preparations for that are now being made. Likewise, the same considerations will be given for another upcoming significant project, South Main Street. This will be a fairly extensive 2024 project to this growing and active area of the community. In addition to road improvements, complete street concepts have been applied to this project, including a multi-use side path and pedestrian crossing between Napoleon and Gypsy Lane roads. Now, perhaps you've picked up at this point, uh, two of the major efforts that were being achieved, trying to be achieved in this budget which is identifying priorities and achieving balance. The proposed new city building is an embodiment of both of those goals. The topic of a new city building has been explored for decades, while other commitments, a recession, and other priorities were balanced. As presented to you in October, the location and concept for the building have been conceived. For purposes of our discussion this evening, the financial component is another critical part of the equation. Funding for the building will be shared by utility and non-utility funds. Funding has already been recommended by the Board of Public Utilities in the electric fund and the 4017 Water and Sewer Capital Improvement Fund. And the administration proposes that debt payments be committed from the 4018 
capital improvement fund for the non-utility portion. The bond for the project will be sold in May and one payment, which is included in the budget, will be made in December. The borrowing environment with very low interest rates is a tremendous opportunity to finance long-term debt right now. Just as one pays for a home over time, the city will make payments on the building for the next 25 to 30 years. The funds in the capital improvement fund are designated for capital use. To be clear, in moving forward with this debt obligation, the city is not taking away operating capacity or otherwise impacting services. In fact, the facility improvements are anticipated to improve service to the citizens and the city as an organization. There are no additional fees to be levied. This will be paid with capital funds that are designated through the predetermined income tax distribution. You'll note on the screen that this capital fund currently has two other buildings in its payment schedule, a portion of the municipal court debt and the community center. With those debts nearing their completion, adequate capacity for the non-utility payment portion is available. There are several designated capital funds as part of the budget. Our financial system uses a numbering system that each thousand designates a different fund family, so to say. So in this case, the 4,000 series of funds are the capital funds. And if anybody's curious, uh, the 1,000 numbers are general funds, 2,000 num number series are special revenue funds, 3,000 series are debt funds, 5,000 utility funds, and the 6,000 series are intergovernmental funds. Um, but back to the capital funds, that's what we're talking about here. In keeping our balance and prioritizing themes, the capital budgets include several items associated with ongoing payments, such as the building debts we just discussed and other programs such as leases for vehicles. In addition to our ongoing vehicle lease program, four police cruisers will be added. Note that the old vehicles will be sold. We aren't increasing our fleet size, uh, simply changing the way that the vehicles are funded. We had paid for them in full before, now we will be leasing them. We are pleased that last year's program, which included two traditional vehicles and two hybrids, was a successful opportunity for comparison and that the police have requested that the four replacement vehicles be hybrids. Also next year, the Public Works Division will replace a 2003 rear load packer at a cost of approximately $225,000. At the 2020 budget hearing, so approximately one year ago, and in the 2020 budget, needed improvements for the police building were discussed. The building needs a new HVAC system, but in evaluating the building, it was determined that improvements to increase energy efficiency should be done prior to the replacement so that the new HVAC unit can be the correct size and placed for maximum efficiency and effectiveness. The 2020 funding was placed in reserve to fund a portion of the work and a two-year program of improvements is recommended. This work will include repairs to seal the building envelope, tuck point masonry joints, seal replace windows and window sills, fix deteriorating concrete areas, and modernize certain equipment such as replacing the indoor diesel generator in the garage with an outdoor natural gas generator. Other reserve funding, you might want to think of that kind of as a savings account, um, is in place for equipment replacements for the arborist and for a fire engine as well. I've already mentioned that the city monitors its debt capacity and balances of the obligations of past debts with current demands and known future debts. The table on the slide shows the current non-utility payments. Note that five different funds are utilized for these payments. The North Main project will be the next piece of debt coming off in 2022, and the before mentioned municipal court and community center buildings paid in the 4018 fund will follow. The aquatic center is paid through a voted levy. When I look at the timing for the final payments for I-75 and for the veterans building, the 2040s seems really far away. However, 
I can remember working on a chart very similar to this and thinking that 2023 and 2028, the municipal court and community center were the furthest out payments and that that was really far away. So somehow time goes by quicker than we realize. In terms of city operations, the focus and priorities of our local government changed and shifted more dramatically and more quickly when the pandemic hit than I have ever witnessed in my 20 plus years in local government. Like our residents, businesses, schools, our university, every part of our lives, we had to make changes, adapt, adjust priorities, reassess, and learn to operate in a world that looks very different than it did when we began this year. We had to balance health, safety, economy, and so much more with priorities and balance changing as we learn new information and when its outcomes, impacts, and the like. How different things are now from the time when council identified the goals listed on the screen. Yet, just because our priorities shifted to meet an emergency and an emerging time, we've continued to keep these goals as part of the city work and as appropriate included funding for 2021. Working down the list, the first goal relates to the community action plan and ongoing efforts to implement initiatives related to neighborhood revitalization efforts. Specifically, council identified a request for public art. For the past several years, a CAP micro grant has been included in the budget to support neighborhood initiatives. Now, I just wanna make a quick note that that is different than the numerous home rehabilita rehabilitation grants that are administered by our grants administration office. It is suggested that the program designated be expanded to also allow for public art. And we request that council perhaps better define how you'd like those funds to be utilized in 2021. The zoning code update, which in part reflects the ongoing cap implementation as it is addressing some of the prioritized items from the action list is ongoing. Funding is not needed for 2021 because the money is encumbered in the 2020 budget. However, with the goal to have the code updated by December 31st, 2021, and we are still on track for that goal, there will be a lot of work done by staff the Planning Commission, Council, and our citizens to consider these changes. The city's zoning code is a very important part of our community. And although this will be challenging work that lies ahead of us, it is also an exciting opportunity for our community. As you are likely aware, longtime Economic Development Director Sue Clark is retiring soon. Katie Thompson, who is the new director, is aware of Council's goal to analyze and update the city's economic development approach and has actively discussed that process with her board of trustees. She also plans to engage the city actively in this process, which is scheduled to occur in 2021. At a meeting of the Transportation and Safety Committee of Council in early November, we discussed the process to move forward with planning for a pathway to reach the community center and Kogan's Crossing. At that time, we discussed due to staffing shortages as a result of the hiring freeze in engineering, hiring this work to an outside firm. Funding was not included specifically in the budget, but for a reason. Staff considered the matter and realized that we need to conduct some organizational work on the various sidewalk referral, deferrals, rights of way, future transportation projects, and other components before engineering work, whether we choose to do that in or out of in-house or, or it's hired out um, is done. I suggest that this is an example of an item that was pushed back due to the pandemic response and adjustments will be part of the city's 2021 goals to organize and develop a plan for council's future consideration. We spent time earlier in the presentation discussing streets and roads. As it relates to complete streets, there are both financial and action impacts to note. All street upgrades include new ADA ramps. Additionally, council passed legislation increasing the width of new sidewalks to five feet. You'll note that major road projects, Wooster Street, I-75 Interchange, South Main Street, are being designed with multi-use paths. I-75 and South Main, 
improved and safer crossings and emphasis on pedestrian safety in all of the projects. We are also updating signals when appropriate. For example, touchless crossing buttons are being installed at the four corners to improve safety and traffic flow. The timing of lights, which is good uh, for drivers who want to make the light uh, and keep moving, and the positive environmental impact of fewer stops has been done and continues to get reevaluated. These examples are provided to demonstrate that complete streets are being considered in the work that occurs in the city of Bowling Green. While an ADA ramp may not generate a picture on the front of the newspaper, it makes an impact on the ability for everyone to safely navigate our town, and that is most certainly a core tenant of implementing complete streets. We've discussed several sustainability-related issues throughout this presentation, such as energy efficiency, congestion mitigation, moving to hybrid vehicles, and even the new city building, which will, be, which will prioritize and evaluate ways to promote sustainability and energy efficiency. Council identified a food waste compost program as part of its commitment to the city's sustainability values. Funding has been included in the 2021 budget to launch a pilot food waste compost drop-off. The city will partner with Go Zero to provide a food waste compost drop-off station at the public works garage near the yard waste drop-off. Go Zero will provide watertight 64 gallon rollout carts lined with compostable liners, which will be serviced regularly and the company will empty and clean the carts on site. All compostable material will be delivered to an Ohio EPA licensed food waste composting facility. The roughly $10,000 budgeted for this initiative will also include an educational campaign for usage of the site, including education to minimize contamination. The site will be advertised in March of 2021. The city will monitor usage, interest, contamination levels, tonnage collected and expenses for six months. A summary report and recommendation will be presented to council after August and prior to your 2022 budget. The last part of the presentation will be a strategic review of some of our funds. Earlier in the presentation, we shared with you that the unanticipated revenue received in 2020 will impact the city's financial position for 2021. Specifically, leaving an adequate general fund balance that allows us to recommend, because it is a short-term determination, that there will be a gap between estimated revenue expenses in the 2021 budget. Budget nuances impact each annual budget. While it's important and beneficial to gauge the history of a fund over time, if you look through old budget books, um, am I the only one that thinks that's fun to look through old budget books? <laughs> I think Councilman Harold likes to look through old budget books. <laughs> You'd like to note one time or year specific nuances that impact the year's budget. For example, in 2020, there was a 27th pay, so salaries appear increased. In 2021, a budget nuance is related to the building at 130 South Main Street. The building was sold in 2020, and therefore the revenue shows in 2020. However, the bond anticipation note for that purchase will be paid off in May 2021, so that expense shows up in 2021. We've mentioned in a prior section that the city plans to purchase a bond in May of 2021. We are pleased that going into that activity, we can show an increasing balance in the general fund that gets increasingly closer to the 25% targeted fund balance in the city's finance and debt policy. In fact, based on our estimates for 2021, we are only a little over $25,000 from that target, which is well within the anticipated margin for a projection. The financial impacts of this year also demonstrate the importance of these reasonable balance levels. The unanticipated revenue was a relief and made a significant impact. And while had we not received that revenue, we'd be having a very conver different conversation today, the city would not, the city would have been able to bridge the gap even though appropriate 
the city would not have been able to bridge the gap even though appropriate adjustments were made. This is when my staff laughs at me because I'm having a little bit of trouble with my reading vision and that was at the bottom of a page. <laughs> they threatened to hold it out here for me. <laughs> if I had a time machine and uh, you could take me back uh, to this day and I saw, a f you showed me this, um, I would honestly be flummoxed as to what could have occurred to result in a budget that would look like this. Um, but then again, we've never seen a year like 2020. And I need to say just one more time, because I'm coming to a close on this presentation, that our financial system passed the test this year. It was difficult. We were challenged. But we rose to that challenge. And because we did so, we are finding our balance of how to move into 2021. Speaking of being adaptable and finding balance, the Parks and Recreation Funds and the Department 2 had to be all of that and more in 2020. You'll see that large dip in 2020, which shows a sharp decrease in both revenue and expense for 2020 as adjustments were made to respond to the changing environment. As noted in our executive summary, we do want to remind you that the current property tax levy for parks and recreation needs to go on the ballot this year, and a committee will soon be formed to provide recommendations to council. Due to unanticipated revenue, particularly the refunds from the, bureaus of work, the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, the police and fire levy funds were able to endure the decrease in income tax and continue to fund the officers who are funded by these levies. If you see former council member Bob McCumber, you can thank him for the picture on this slide. The history on the slide does not go back quite far enough to tell the story of the fire levy fund, but there was a time when there were significant financial challenges associated with this fund. An additional 0 0.08 levy passed by our voters in 2010, and balance efforts with the general fund are part of the recovery story. We are pleased that the targeted fund balance has now been achieved consistently since 2019, and it is so again in 2021, and we feel that the right balance for this fund has been finally achieved. The water and sewer capital improvement budget was reviewed as part of a previous joint session with the Board of Public Utilities. As a reminder, this is an income tax fund dedicated for utility purposes. You'll note that the large rise in both revenue and expense, and the main reason is to account for the potential EDA grant. If funding is not received, revenue will not be as high and expenses will be lower as well. The remainder of the budget was assembled, much has been described throughout this presentation, finding balance and identifying priorities. In this case, there are several debt payments allocated to this fund. Additional work and projects to improve the city's critical water and sewer infrastructure will occur in 2021. Capital items discussed previously are in several funds, and featured here is the 4018 Capital Improvement Fund. Adequate alignment for anticipated revenue and expense is achieved here, along with a recommended fund balance slightly above its target. Charts like uh, this next one kind of remind me of abstract art, so I, I kind of am always a little intrigued by these. Uh, the dramatic fluctuations from previous years are associated with grant dollars and or years when cash balance was adequate and utilized for street construction, repair, or maintenance. We reviewed the proposed expenditures for roads pretty extensively earlier, but the previous chart as well as this one show the financial impacts from the areas that fund the majority of the debt and our ongoing road work. Looking ahead, we know that additional debt will be leveraged in this fund and thus maintaining an adequate balance is key to keeping this fund healthy and prepared to fund our critical road work. 
we made it to the end. <laughs> uh, before I turn it back to the committee, I do want to give a, a few notes of recognition here. Uh, the 2021 budget involved the entire executive staff. Um, again, most of them joining us here on Zoom, the judge and the staff at the Bowling Green Municipal Court and beyond. It is not just our budget book or this presentation that makes a budget. It reflects the work all year and numerous staff members are involved in the conscientious administration of these funds. Brian O'Connell, Jackie Spangenberg and the utility division heads do a tremendous job with the utility budget along with all of our department and division heads. So I thank you all. The budget team, I have finance director Bushong and assistant municipal administrator Fawcett are key to the successful preparation of this budget. And I'm appreciative to both of you for your hard work and dedication. That completes my report this evening, subject to your questions. Wow, thank you, Lori. Um, what, what are, what are the, Positive picture, all things considered, um, <clears throat> you know, two two recurring themes, you know, the word balance. I think that that's critical to our assessment of of this of this budget. Balance between the limitations and the priorities that are set. Balance between our current needs and our long term strategic view. Uh, this this budget seems to strike all the balance in all of the necessary uh, relevant areas and thoroughness. Uh, Everything that you've talked about touches on all of the issues that that are you know relevant or or newly relevant because of the situation in 2020. Things that we took for granted in the past have to be looked at under a microscope, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, so I'll uh, turn over to my colleagues for questions. Mandy, any? Um. I have no specific questions. I was reserving my comments after we heard the, the oral presentation. And, uh, you know, once again, um, I am delighted to serve on a city council that has a budget coming out with graphs that look as good as some of these do during a pandemic. It's, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal how you were able to accomplish this. And I know it took the work of every single employee to make this happen. Um, and I also want to say I'm very thankful that Ryan Bouchon decided to extend his time with the city under their employment. Um, oh, God, what would we have done without you? I just can't imagine how awful it would have been um, for the rest of the administration to face preparing a budget without you. You are correct. Um, <laughs> I second that motion. <laughs> and finally, I want to say that the community members should be thrilled that they reside in Bowling Green, Ohio, where we have a city that has continually come up with budgets that are thinking of, of maintenance of what has to be maintained, services that have to be delivered, and livability. And I think we have an extra um, emphasis on livability more so than we've ever had in the past. And to come out of pandemic and still be able to look forward to having things going smoothly and having progress continue in our city should make us all very, very proud to live here. And I know that's something that communities the size of Bowling Green are not able to accomplish. And, and we are really blessed to be able to be where we are right now in this community. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Bill? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. I said most of what I was going to say at the beginning. A uh, couple of things. One, um, one would expect, uh, given what uh, the country and communities have gone through, that it would be a success just merely to tread water. And uh, this is not where we're at. We are not, all, we're beyond that. We're actually swimming toward targets. And uh, that's astounding. Uh, second, uh, I've noticed in the in the graphs that um, we are basically uh, in the in the right ballpark with the targeted fund balances, and part of that, of course, is the planning that went on, and part of it is prior planning, because if you look at the graphs, it's like we had a surplus to the targeted fund balance. So we've managed a, a cushion to the cushion, if you will, and now we're. We, because of that, because of the, the past decisions that have been made, 
we're at a place where we can actually still have uh, meeting the, the targeted fund balances. Uh, as far as specific questions, I don't know if this is the place, but I'll just bring a couple up. One, this year, uh, one of the many impressive things that the administration, and, and I, I attribute that to uh, uh, the mayor and you, Lori, uh, with ample assistance from the other directors, is uh, the concentration on uh, maintaining safety of employees and safety of the community in interaction, interacting with the employees. We've, we've seen that just walking in the city building. Um, you treated that uh, very wisely as a priority. When this all hit, you shifted into taking care of that and it's been constant. I, I can't imagine how many extra hours a week you have spent by doing the, what you need to do in the normal course of events. And then also on top of that, the, uh, the safety issue. So I'm, I think that in acknowledgement of the work that you've done in that, that it would be uh, prudent to add that as a priority because it definitely was a priority this year. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's still gonna be a priority for next year. So that would be one humble suggestion. As far as uh, other specific questions, I'll just give two examples and I don't need an answer right now. And there was a, a bit of discussion in the uh, executive summary about some buildings that needed repair. And I was wondering if the Thurston Fire Facility needs any significant repairs and whether that's reflected in the budget. It's kind of a, a tough situation because who knows what's going to happen with that with that building. But anyway, that's just something to... We can provide an update for you on that. Uh, funded in the 2020 budget, if you may recall, a year ago was to do an assessment of uh, that um, area. Right. We hired the Ohio Fire Chiefs to conduct that and have them look at the city's overall positioning of its fire stations, its personnel numbers, look at its response areas, the times of responses, and do a thorough independent analysis of what the ideals would be for the city moving forward. That should that fire station you know, not be located there, where should it be located? Right. And that was a little bit delayed by the pandemic, uh, but the fire chiefs did come actually in person in September and uh, spent a couple of days here in Bowling Green with, with our fire folks driving around mapping, our GIS uh, department did a fantastic job giving them uh, just massive amounts of details as people who love data. It's probably stuff uh, you'd, you'd love to look through, but um, we don't have that report back yet. So I think that's one component. You are correct. That fire station, uh, we did an analysis of it, I think back 2019 maybe, that we did a building analysis of it. It, ha it is in need of several repairs. We asked the people doing the analysis to prioritize. Was there anything that would be a safety concern in the building? Would there be anything that could pro, you know, be reasonably priced to prolong the use of the building? Out of that last in this earlier this year, I believe, or late in 19, we did employ some work to be done on some areas that were shifting in the, the building. But depending on what happens there, that will be an ongoing conversation that I think we need to have. And as you said, that's going to be a balance. So unlike the police station, you know, that we know, um, you know, we need to invest in, it, it's there, it's iconic, it's, it's a beautiful historic building. Uh, you know, that fire station may be a, a different story in the long term view. So how do you balance that out? Something we'll certainly keep council in the loop on. Well, I certainly know how old it is since <laughs> I was on council when we put it, put it there in the first place. And uh, it does give an example of how some some issues uh, cycle back around because it was a big issue in the 80s uh, as far as where to locate fire facilities. Uh, thank you. I look forward to that. I'd appreciate it if once you get a better idea of when that report's going to come out, uh, I think it might be prudent to uh, schedule a transportation and safety committee meeting to go sure. over that. Uh, and then related to transportation and safety committee meeting, when would you like... I I imagine it would probably be maybe January. When would you like 
uh, Transportation and Safety Committee meeting to go over uh, the uh, uh, prospective uh, paving um, list and priorities. And again, yeah, I don't, we will have to get back yeah, with you yeah, on that. Fine. We Just can talk to to uh, Mr. Kraft on that a little bit. Thank you, Lori. Sure. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. That it. Well, again, Lori, thank you very much. Um, great presentation. Look forward to moving the budget forward. Okay. Thank you.